Right. So as many of you um, are aware, we're currently running a consultation to find out views to help us set an interim target for emissions reduction by 2030. And this target will ensure that we'll be on track to achieve our net zero um, target by 2050. And we felt that it is important for you, members of the public, to understand some of the areas that play a key role for emissions reduction by 2030. And that's why we're running a series of events um, to provide you with that information. And this evening, um, this webinar is focused on electricity generation, which will be presented by Steve Forden. Steve joined DEFA as its head of energy policy um, at the end of last year. He previously worked within the UK government on climate and energy issues since 2013, first in the Department for Energy and Climate Change and then Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. He covered a range of issues from UK net zero targets, bioenergy, energy innovation, the economic impacts of climate change, shale gas, the UK's greenhouse gas inventory and input into the intergovernmental panel on climate change. His academic background is in climate science. And with that, um, I hand you over to Steve to present today's webinar. So Steve, over to you. OK, uh, thanks, Rose, and uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, spending your Thursday evening with us. Um, just getting a little bit of feedback. So could I just ask everyone to check that their mics are, mute, mics are muted? I think they are now. OK, I will just uh, start the process of screen sharing. So just bear with me a second. OK. OK, great. Um, OK, so uh, as Rose has said, this will take about 30 minutes or so. And actually, I'll put a timer on to stop myself droning on excessively. Uh, there we go. Um, and we're going to cover three things today. Going to give you some background and context uh, about uh, decarbonisation generally from a global perspective. I think that's useful because it allows us to better understand uh, where the Isle of Man sits and how we relate to that bigger picture we're ultimately all aiming for. Um, <clears throat> next, I'll talk a little bit in terms of the background of the modelling work that was done to come up with the future energy scenarios. And finally, I'll uh, quickly run through the scenarios themselves to give you a sense of the potential different options that were identified to enable us to decarbonise our uh, electricity generation system and contribute in a big way to meeting net zero. So firstly, a big picture look at energy system transformation at a global level. And as I say, I think this is useful because it gives us that background perspective as to why we're here and why we're doing this in the Isle of Man and how it fits into that bigger picture. So firstly, why are we here specifically? Well, the, actually a large reason we're here relates to this incredibly boring bit of text that I've screen grabbed from a report uh, some of you may have heard of, some of you may have not, but it was the um, special report on global warming of one and a half degrees. And that was produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is effectively the scientific advisory body to an organisation called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And that's the, that's the UN organisation under which the Paris Agreement sits. And this uh, bit of text was ultimately the en end result of many years of sort of intertwined climate policy and scientific evidence. And momentum had been building for quite a while, um, particularly from small island states and developing countries um, for the inclusion of a one and a half degree target in the Paris Agreement. However, when the Paris Agreement was signed, which did in fact include that target, um, there was actually quite a lot of surprising level of uncertainty as to whether one and a half degrees was actually feasible in the real world. So the UNFCCC asked the scientific community via the IPCC to go through acronym HELL to come up with uh, the best scientific evidence they could to, to take whether we can actually restrict global warming to one and a half degrees. And this is ultimately what they concluded, this, this uh, very scientific and dry bit of text. But the key point is, and why we're here today, um, it def def defined a successful one and a half Paris compliant pathway as reaching net zero CO2 emissions by the middle of the century and crucially uh, seeing deep reductions in other greenhouse gases such as methane. So what does that look like in practice? Um, well, that's the graph on the left 
So that's total global total net CO2 emissions. And the basic evolution of those emissions pathways is to um, rise a little bit, peak essentially now, um, decline by 2030, and then very rapidly decline towards uh, zero in 2050, and actually in the real world carry on declining to net, zero, uh, net negative CO2 emissions, where we're actually removing more CO2 from the atmosphere than, than, we're, than we're putting in. So that's what a, a compliant uh, 1.5 degree pathway looks at the global level for CO2. And you can also see um, concurrent uh, emission reductions in other greenhouse gases, um, particularly methane um, that, accomp that accompanies those, those CO2 emissions decrease. So that's, that's why we're here on the Isle of Man. That's why, why we're talking about mid-century uh, net zero emissions because of that, these, these pathways at the global level and we're being consistent with those. Within that broad sort of sweep of, of pathways towards net zero, there's actually a range of different ways you can get there. And that's what this slide is intended to illustrate. This was um, a summary figure in that uh, report on 1.5 degrees that I mentioned. And what it's essentially saying is, though broadly the, the pathways look quite similar, peaking around now, declining very rapidly, there are actually a range of different ways you can achieve that target, depending on your assumptions about the way society evolves. And that's essentially saying we have a choice about the way we can choose to meet these targets, um, again, at the global level. And loosely speaking, the, the graphs on the left are worlds in which we're more sustainable. So we cooperate with each other. Political institutions are strong and orientated towards climate action. Uh, we eat less meat. We manage our land a little better. Um, we have reduced energy demand and generally we live in a more sustainable world. Whereas the pathway on the far right, that's a world in which we kind of don't do any of that good, nice, sustainable stuff. We rely on technical fixes to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and make up for our um, continued um, excessive, depending on your perspective, consumption. Um, Interestingly, in the models that produce these scenarios, in the in the work in their in their assumed socioeconomic world where um, we are slightly dystopian and we don't cooperate and we have lots of rivalry, they weren't able to find pathways to one and a half degrees. So some degree of global cooperation is is necessary to achieve achieve this target. It would appear. But yeah, just to summarise, it, what these what the previous two slides show us is absolutely one and a half degrees is possible, feasible at least in the world of models. And we have a choice as a society about how we can get there. And finally, in this sort of overview section, how are we getting there or how are we doing in terms of getting there? Uh, and the answer is uh, sort of OK, but not good enough, really. Um, we're a lot better than we were. If you'd have produced this thermometer graph even for just five years ago, um, arguably we've been on course for more like four degrees. Uh, of warming by the end of the, the century, or possibly even higher. Whereas the evidence seems to suggest that our current policies will take us to around 2.7 degrees of, of warming, roughly. And the range there is, is largely a, a function of how the climate system actually responds to our emissions, and there's a degree of uncertainty about that. If you assume we successfully implement all the targets that people have made for the end of this decade, then you get down to 2.4 degrees. If you assume we um, meet um, our pledges for the end of the decade and some point later in the century that people have started to make mid-century pledges like the Isle of Man, then you get down to two degrees ish. And if you were very optimistic, squinted and had your you know, best sunny disposition on, you might think that it's possible based on current policies, pledges and ambition that we might be somewhere around 1.8 degrees. Um, so we're in a better position than we were. Um, and in large part, that's come from public pressure, business pressure, and the, the fact that governments have had to respond to the, the strength of the scientific evidence, but we're not, we're not there yet. So that's the big picture in which the Isle of Man is sitting. And essentially, the, the plans that we have in place, our targets are totally consistent with this, with this uh, wider perspective that the world has chosen to pursue, albeit not yet sufficiently ambitiously in terms of real world policies. So I'll then talk a little bit about the model and the work that was done to produce the future energy scenarios. So firstly, um, the, in December 2020, the government launched its future energy scenarios. 
the aim of which is to explore the pathways that would enable us to meet two uh, important targets. The first is to ensure that 75% of the island's electricity is generated from renewable sources uh, by 2035 and to deliver net zero emissions by 2050. Um, electricity generation is responsible for a substantial fraction of uh, greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gas emissions on the island. Um, and most crucially, without decarbonizing electricity, without removing the emissions from uh, the electricity generation process, it's extremely challenging to reduce emissions in other areas because we're assuming that to decarbonize those other areas like heat and transport that we'll have to electrify them at least in large part. And so without a decarbonized electricity source for those other sectors, actually getting to net zero becomes extremely difficult. So um, in this work, we're guided by um, a number of principles. Um, the three of which the sort of key ones really are the classic um, Steve you're muted oh that's really weird can you hear me now Rose I can't hear you yes we can hear you now OK, what did you hear the last slide? Um, yes, we heard you were introducing the energy trilemma. It's really strange. OK, um, uh, OK, so yes, energy trilemma. That's how we um, yeah, how we balance these um, respective and potentially competing trade offs in an energy system. So we have to have um, we have to aim to minimize the environmental impacts of the energy supply source. In this case, primarily we are concerned about uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but not exclusively. Um, there are other potential impacts of, an, uh, of a, the generation that we choose to adopt. So, for example, uh, there may be impacts on biodiversity from bioenergy, and I'm going to come on to that later. Um, there are landscape impacts from renewables um, and all those other things that are important as well. So, you know, we're primarily guided by CO2, um, but actually it's a, it's a broader set of sustainability issues there that matter too. Um, we have to have a, an affordable um, means of generation. Um, we're all, you know, increasingly painfully aware, I think, of the cost of um, energy from gas at the moment for heating our homes. And wherever possible, we have to minimise um, the costs to consumers and particularly ensure that that cost is distributed fairly across society. Uh, and finally, we need secure, secure and reliable supply. Uh, has to be able to meet our demand and any projected future demand and be able to handle um, system shocks um, with minimal disruption to supply. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about th that issue as we go along through the slides. So what does our current uh, energy electricity generation mix look like? Well, um, a key point to note is that we're not on the island in any way energy independent. We generate the vast and overwhelming majority of our um, electricity from imported energy sources, be it natural gas through the pipeline uh, between Scotland and Ireland, um, imported diesel, um, or the interconnector that connects us into the UK, um, UK grid. We have um, some homegrown sources in terms of the Sully Hydro Reservoir, and we also have the energy from waste plant, but uh, we import our energy. And we're currently uh, primarily reliant on the Polrose gas power plant and the interconnector that comes across from, from the UK. And all of that is designed to meet a peak demand of around 80 megawatts. Um, and has sufficient backup and resilience that if one of those um, or two of those um, generation systems were to go offline, then other things could be in place to replace it. So thinking about the sort of basic principles that we care about here, most of this might seem fairly obvious, but I think it's important to stress them because it sets the, the guiding um, principles really that we need to, to, we need to make sure we anchor our electricity system to as we evolve it in the future. And as I say, most of this stuff sounds obvious, but it helps me to think around the problem anyway. So I'm gonna, gonna going to talk through them in a little bit of uh, a little bit further on this slide. So what does the system need to do? Well, most obviously it needs to be on. 
um, and it needs to be on all the time. And that actually is not necessarily quite as straightforward as it might seem, particularly if we're dealing with a world with increased uh, use of renewables. Uh, it has to respond to changing demand over time. Uh, demand is not static, it changes throughout the day. Uh, and uh, an energy system, uh, electricity generation system, has to be able to respond and match that changing load as it varies over the course of the day. Uh, most notably when we all get home from work and, and um, uh, have a cup of tea and, and turn the TV on. So it has to be able to follow, um, has to be sufficiently flexible and robust to be able to follow that changing demand over, over the course of the day. And it has to be able to respond to unexpected or temporary events. So it has, there has to be resilience and systems in place for, for the electricity system to be able to um, be able to meet demand and respond to those anything unexpected or dramatic that's happened. And now that might be um, something breaking or it might be dealing with price spikes. That's something else I'm going to talk about um, talk about in, in a few slides time. So what are our options for this future uh, electricity system, this future net zero electricity system? Um, a number, um, most of which we included in, in the modelling, and I'll talk a little bit about each of those now. So firstly, the uh, interconnectors. Um, they emerge as quite a promising option because they're relatively cheap. Um, they work out quite cheaply in terms of capital costs to build them uh, and quite cheap in terms of the maintenance costs to keep them up and running. Um, they're good because they provide uh, the flexibility and resilience that we need. They offer power that can be available according to need and meet that demand. They can The interconnect can respond uh, in less than a second if it, if it needs to. So it's very, very flexible. So it can provide reliable, reliable uh, electricity to us. It can also provide what are known as uh, ancillary services. Uh, I'm not an expert on these by any means, but it's essentially the things that the engineers at the MUA do, Manx Utilities Authority do, to keep the, the grid, grid stable and within its required um, frequency and, and voltage limits and so on. Uh, and the interconnector allows, allows for that. Also, it potentially uh, if we think of electric energy coming in our way from the UK, it also can operate in reverse. We can sell uh, electricity back to the UK grid depending on their need, and that offers us uh, a potential economic benefit as well. The primary disadvantage, though, is uh, it we're, means we're continue, we continue to be reliant on other jurisdictions for our um, electricity supply. Biomass is a slot. I'm going to actually have a, a, a dedicated slide on this shortly because I know it's an area a lot of people are interested and potentially concerned about. But just to briefly summarise, um, it, it's a potentially promising option because it can provide, depending on the type of generating unit you use, it can provide that flexible power on demand that helps us to meet changing, uh, changing demand over the course of the day. It can be turned on quickly. Uh, so it acts as acts um, to provide that sort of system resilience that we need. Um, biomass in general also can be helped to use decarbonize, helped to decarbonize other sectors like uh, like heat. And providing you get it right, it is a renewable source of electricity. But more more on that shortly. Um, its primary disadvantages are there's actually there's just fundamentally a limit to the amount of bio biomass that can be sustainably sourced on island um, and in general if we had to import it. So there are, there's just you know, fundamentally there's a limit to the amount that, that, of, uh, that we can use uh, and potentially uh, there can be issues with, with air quality pollution as well. Um, a technology we didn't actually include in the modelling uh, but is something that uh, increasingly uh, appears likely to exist in the future as small modular nuclear reactors. Um, they have a number of benefits. Um, you, they're small but they produce a lot of electricity uh, in a small area uh, they're very reliable or they should be very reliable um, they have a lot of jobs associated with them but there are disadvantages as well there's clearly big public perception issues around safety there is nuclear waste issues um, that have to be managed and regulated and we don't have an experience of, of regulation and security for nuclear on on island uh, next come to renewables um, Fairly obviously, they're um, sources of electricity generation that are powered by natural resources like wind, tide, uh, tidal and solar. But the key issue is that they're dependent on the weather. And so in a renewable dominated uh, electricity system, you have to have a system in place to balance those renewables with some form of reliable low carbon power that is available as and when you need it, as and when needed. 
And absolutely that can be done, but it just has to be done and you have to make sure your system is set up to be an, enable that. And to illustrate this, this is a very recent data that I just uh, I just grabbed, um, which is um, uh, the UK, oh, sorry, GB grid um, last week. And that's showing on the left hand side, it was very uh, cloudy and there wasn't much wind around. And so this sort of browny, ugly, gray color that's making up most of the generation is gas. Whereas as you got towards the weekend, uh, Saturday 29th of January, you're seeing the blue color it come in, which is wind dominating the system. And that's great, but you need something in place uh, that has to be uh, able to operate when the wind isn't blowing. I and mean, in the future, we need that thing to be low carbon. We need it to be not the muddy gray color uh, gas plants. And that's that's fundamentally the challenge when you have increasing amounts of renewables on your grid. You have to balance it with something that's reliable and low carbon to ensure you've got a stable and well balanced electricity system. Um, interconnectors just briefly are increasingly seen as a promising, promising option, um, particularly across Europe where uh, you can, to some extent, deal with the problems of in, intermittent renewables by exporting power from areas where renewables are on to areas where they're not on. Um, the UK likes it as well. Um, they've got uh, four gigawatts of interconnect capacity and are planning significantly more. Um, and we have an existing uh, 60 megawatt alternating current uh, uh, interconnector that's um, that's very very useful for us connects us into the uk provides all those ancillary services that i mentioned um, and is a reliable source of electricity bioenergy so yeah i did look at this because i know it's an area that people are are are, are concerned about um, the first thing to say is bioenergy in theory is a carbon neutral process because the co2 that sucked out as the as the biomass substance is growing um, is offset by the emissions when when it's combusted so that process is clearly carbon neutral you it comes down from the atmosphere goes back up to the atmosphere and the whole process is is carbon neutral in reality it's a little bit more complicated um, the first point i really want to stress actually is that there's no one single thing called bioenergy um, and that leads into debates that are quite binary bioenergy good bioenergy bad when in fact it's a lot more complicated Bioenergy can derive from a large variety of material, which are commonly known as feedstocks. Uh, that can be food waste, agricultural waste, dedicated energy crops, like uh, tall perennial grasses called scanthus, or more controversially, uh, maize. Um, it can be uh, uh, fast-growing tree species like willow, or it can be um, uh, um, harvested um, wood pellets, um, and the most controversial element of that is importing in the, the UK imports wood pellets from southeast US forests and, and burns them in a former coal plant called Drax. Um, those feedstocks can be burnt directly, combust, combusted directly um, as solid solid biomass, or they can be chemically and physically converted into liquids and gases through processes known such as pyrolysis and gasification. And because it can be converted into a wide, wide variety of uh, energy sources, um, it's seen really the sort of scientific evidence really strongly stresses that it's a very very key part of reaching that net zero um, target and when it's well sourced uh, it can be carbon neutral and it can bring other sustainability and societal benefits uh, it tends to be quite good for jobs um, if you do the right thing in the right place it can actually be surprisingly good for biodiversity it helps with um, water runoff if you plant a forest in the right place all those sorts of things however there is the very real possibility that you can do bioenergy very, very, very badly and you uh, end up with a very high carbon source of bioenergy and you absolutely have to get your sourcing of the material correct. Simply put, if we planted a load of um, miscanthus, which is a, a fast growing energy crop on um, a well, uh, a nicely intact peat bog in our uplands, that would be a very bad thing to do because you would have uh, a carbon neutral uh, energy crop that was planted on uh, on something that was not carbon neutral. So you would have destroyed the peat and caused a lot of emissions that it would take a very long time for your bioenergy to actually ultimately offset. So if you if we're going to do bioenergy, we have to do it right. And we have we're planning a, a scoping study on that actually, which will enable us to answer those key questions around um, sustainable sourcing. Right. 
So slightly aware of time, so I'll attempt to speed up a little. Um, this is one of the most important slides in the whole presentation. What it's telling us, and in some ways this makes our task a bit easier than places like the UK, what it's telling us is regardless of net zero, even if you didn't care about net zero, we still have to replace our current electricity generation system, basically because it's all coming to the end of its life. So even if we weren't doing it net zero, we would be spending a large amount of money on replacing our existing system. So in 2028, the diesels are basically going to fall over. Um, the CCTG is coming towards the end of its life in the 2030s, and it might potentially be quite early in the 2030s if we're importing uh, gas from the UK that has hydrogen blended in it that the CCGT can't cope with. And if you include fuel costs, and those fuel costs actually may well be higher than they are in this slide, you're talking about a total cost of replacement of about 1.3 billion. So that's a cost we have to bear as uh, a society, as government, um, regardless of what we plan to do for net zero. So that's really important. So onto the methodology of the work itself. I won't go into this in too much detail, but basically we appointed a company called Ovarup to prepare the scenarios, considering those issues around the energy trilemma. Uh, they were supported by a team and uh, the climate change transformation team, uh, max utilities from that sort of technical perspective of how our grid works and other people across government. And I just want to stress that this wasn't, you know, it wasn't me in my bedroom with a spreadsheet. These were leading world leading experts who really know their stuff. The model that they used has been used extensively by the UK government, by the national grid to make sure its own grid is working properly. Uh, the US government are using it to think how they can decarbonize their vast electricity supply system. The EU have used it on the cost side. It's a it's a world leading model. We're not just getting some, you know, complete cowboys to come up with something on the, the back of an envelope. Into that model, we inputted a bunch of potential technologies, uh, essentially renewables, interconnector, hydropower, uh, and, and, the, and gas, uh, though that obviously gets discounted because there's um, an emissions limit, although potentially you could convert it to a hydrogen gas plant. Um, we then assume um, some degree of changing future demand for electricity. So the fact that we're going to potentially probably have to increase the uh, the the amount of demand um, that we're assuming um, we've that's been accounted for so we've accounted for the fact that we're going to probably electrify things there's going to be more electric vehicles on the road there's going to be more heat pumps in people's houses etc cetera, etc cetera. all of those things are accounted for in the modeling work also accounted for is changing uh, costs over time of different generation technologies and again, we we're in a really fortunate position here because the organization we contracted, Ovarup, are absolutely leading in terms of their ability to forecast, as, as well as anyone can do this sort of forecasting, future energy prices. Um, they, uh, they, I'm not sure about the, the latest one, but certainly the previous UK government um, cost estimates for low carbon technologies were produced uh, by, by the Arup team that we employed. So again, we're, we're getting really, really leading people. And ultimately, when they took, took all those assumptions, plugged it all in, um, the, uh, they plugged it all into their model, which is essentially this. It's an attempt to replicate what the electricity system might look like on the island based on very, various different sources of generation, uh, heading into people's homes, people's businesses, uh, leisure centres, et cetera, et cetera. And that's fundamentally what this clever model is trying to do. It's replicating that whole system across a range of future scenarios. It's important though to recognize that the sort of limitations of this kind of modeling, it's, it's operating within the parameters and the constraints that we have set it. Um, and it does so on the basis of what's called least cost optimization. It tries to find the lowest cost solution to the problem that you've set it. So it isn't trying to reflect a broader set of societal priority, priorities that we all care about. So it's, it, doesn't care about homegrown jobs versus not getting jobs benefits if we just import things. It doesn't care about biodiversity impacts or landscape impacts. It just cares about finding the cheapest solution to this problem of reaching net zero. Um, so the scenarios we see are a product of that set of assumptions. Then they're not supposed to fully reflect all the decisions we have to make about as a society about um, how we decarbonize electricity section. Uh, electricity system.
So with that said, here are the future energy scenarios. And there are five of them. Scenarios one, two, three, four, and five. And on the left, we have essentially a replace, far left, a sort of replacement of the existing system um, based on not really caring about, about climate. And the, the key thing to note, or a key thing to note here, is around costs. So we talked earlier about it becoming being around 1.3 billion if we were basically just to carry on with business as usual and replace um, replace the system as is. Well, in some of our scenarios, the cost of a decarbonized net zero compliant electricity system is basically the same as just business as usual. And in one scenario, scenario three, it's actually cheaper. So if we're worried about costs, which is absolutely a valid thing to be worried about, I think that tells quite a clear picture that because we're having to replace our electricity system anyway, we can we can talk in a number of cases about costs that are comparable to that exercise of business as usual. Not in all cases, some, co some costs are much higher and I'll talk about why that is later. Um, the other point to note is that the degree to which we supply our own um, our own energy on island varies across the scenarios. Some of them are very heavily import dominated and some of them are very much uh, very much homegrown. So again, that comes back to these sort of societal priorities. What do we care about? Do we care about purely energy resilience at homegrown or do we are we less bothered about that and we're, we're content to import from other jurisdictions? So to go through the scenarios themselves, Scenario one is, I'd say, arguably one of the sort of more balanced ones. Uh, maybe that's a slightly loaded term, but it's uh, more more mixed ones. So um, we see the construction of a new interconnector to the UK. We see a reasonably sizable amount of um, solar, a little bit of energy storage through batteries, um, and we have uh, biomass providing a significant amount of ba backup. Remember, biomass is providing that resilient uh, and flexible backup that we need that's low carbon, assuming we're, we're sourcing it right. And that the solar in particular start to come on quite online quite quickly in this scenario because it helps us avoid initial emissions increases in, in the 2020s. Um, so, yeah, that's what scenario one looks like. It's somewhat mixed, uh, new interconnector capacity, some solar and some biomass. Uh, and a little bit of, of wind as well. That's the green bar at the bottom. The second scenario um, is one that's heavily dominated by interconnectors. So here we build two new interconnectors to GB, uh, bringing in their electricity, providing all the benefits of interconnection and with some biomass. There's not really a lot else in this system, in this uh, scenario. There's a tiny bit of solar, which is designed again to avoid this emissions cap that I just talked about, avoid the emissions reduction, sorry, in, in the in the near term, emissions increase, sorry, in the near term. Um, so in some ways, that's a bit of a, a kind of model, a bit of an artifact of the model, really. And the main take home message from scenario two is that this is a world of interconnection with some backup by, um, by biomass. Scenario three is, is sort of similar, really, um, very similar, in fact, but this just involves constructing one new interconnector and keeping the existing uh, interconnector going for, for longer than its expected lifetime. We're not 100% sure about the feasibility of this. That would have to be have to be investigated. And here again, you've got biomass, biomass backup. Um, the benefit of biomass in these scenarios as well isn't just, isn't just backup. It's also that if we're experiencing price, if the UK is experiencing a price shock for any reason, we can switch off the interconnector and go back to our own biomass, um, on-island biomass source and avoid those really high costs. Um, and that's one of the additional benefits that, that having this reliable on-island uh, low carbon power is being able to deliver for us. Scenario four is one way you're getting more into the world of, of renewables. Um, quite heavily into the world of renewables, in fact, and it's an, a, an electricity system that is dominated by, by variable renewables, but it still has a significant contribution from in, uh, new interconnectors to provide resilience and backup um, if, if needed. In this scenario, we're also seeing quite a lot of um, quite a lot of energy storage. In this instance, the energy storage is coming from um, hydropower effectively and batteries, and what that's doing 
we're building a lot of wind, we're building a lot of solar, and at times when there's an excess of that, we're storing it and we're keeping that stored energy available for those periods where the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. And that's see helping to contribute to seeing us through those periods where variable renewables are not online. So we're getting a lot of our energy online, uh, on island um, from renewable sources, but again, we're still we're still reliant um, on, or the model is still reliant on interconnectors to to keep it to keep it happy. Um, and finally, this is a scenario that was not particularly modelled in detail like the other ones were, but it's looking at a hypothetical system, scenario in which we're getting our uh, most of our electricity from uh, offshore wind. Uh, as you may know, there's a lease. Uh, we have a lease uh, with a company called Orsted for offshore wind uh, in Manx territorial waters. And this is a scenario in which we're really making use of that uh, in a big way. Um, and uh, yeah, we're storing that uh, ele uh, excess electricity that that um, vast amount of wind produces when it's producing it uh, in the form of hydrogen. So we're going through a process called electrolysis, um, which uh, is splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. We're storing the hydrogen and we're keeping that for the periods of time when the wind isn't blowing. And actually, in this case, we're running it um, through, uh, through a hydrogen compliant gas turbine. Um, almost at the end now, vaguely on time. Um, just going back to the costs again, um, the graph on the left, well, firstly, the graphs on the right, that's just to say that the costs, as well as having those forecast costs of the electricity generation units that I included in an earlier slide, this is showing that we're also including uh, assumptions about uh, the future evolution of uh, the cost of fuels. So this is a really comprehensive or as comprehensive as it's possible to be in terms of forecasting the future uh, look at costs. So this is, you know, as best as best an estimate as, as it's possible to make, really. And we've got um, the four scenarios on the left, scenario one, two, three and four, uh, and slightly tweaked variants of each of them. Basically, you don't need to worry too much about those. But what it's basically saying um, is essentially in the scenarios with more renewables the costs are higher and that's because to get the electricity system stable to make sure we're generating enough that we can then store during fallow periods you're having to install a lot of capacity you're having to install a lot of stuff and not that all fundamentally adds up that all adds up to the costs whereas in the scenario three where we're just building one new interconnector we're just not as installing as much physical stuff, so the costs um, the costs are lower fundamentally. We're also assuming, unfortunately, that um, the build costs, the technologies are here are higher than they would be in, in GB uh, because of, sort of economies of scale. Um, and yeah, and there are also a bunch of other sort of um, slightly hidden costs around strengthening the grid in, in the case of, of, of where you have large amounts of renewables. So yeah, the take home, the broad take home message on costs is that the the very heavily renewable dominant scenarios are ones where we're building more physical infrastructure and as a result, the costs are higher. Whereas the, the less you do of building stuff, the costs are lower. And in the scenario three case, as the slide I mentioned earlier showed, um, the costs come in potentially lower than just business as usual, which is which is an interesting conclusion from the research. So finally, uh, and sorry for going a little bit over time, um, just to summarize, um, pathways exist which achieve our goal of net zero uh, emissions by 2050, and they are absolutely feasible. They, they're affordable, uh, depending on your point of view, and they maintain security of supply. So we absolutely can do this. It's technically feasible. So we don't need to worry from, from that perspective. However, we still have decisions to be made as a society about which route we take forward. We've got to balance the net zero ambition we have with other so the other societal priorities we care about. We can cost jobs on island versus just importing, landscape impact. And so ultimately we can do this, but it requires a choice by politicians and by us as a society that weighs up the benefits and the trade-offs of all the different options. Um, and that's ultimately, I think, the, the sort of the main take home message I, I wanted to leave you with. Um, ha very happy to take questions. Entirely possible I don't know the answer to all of your questions. And if I'm not able to answer, then my email address, um, my email address is there for you to for you to take a look at. 
but yeah, happy to happy to take questions. Stop the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. That was a very informative um, presentation. Um, so um, to all the guests, if you have any questions, um, can you please type them in using the chat 